Uh, so, uh, welcome to this edition of Ken Mogi's Street Brain Radio. Uh, I am now walking uh, from uh, Tokyo FM, uh, which is uh, one of the major radio uh, stations in Tokyo, uh, broadcast all over Japan through the networks of radio stations. And now I'm walking, walking to TV Asahi, uh, TV Asahi, where I will be on a live news and Kind of affairs show. So today is a kind of a media day for me. Uh, but um, today I would like to talk about laughter or comedy uh, as a really wonderful aspect of human life and something I love and something I suspect that we need. Uh, I always refer back to Friedrich Nietzsche's gay science, in which Nietzsche, the philosopher, proclaimed that. Uh, the era of tragedy is going to be over and the era of laughter, comedy, would come. And this, I think, is one of the most significant predictions ever made by a philosopher. A prediction that when it's fulfilled would make us a better person. And I believe in that. <clears throat> because if I look back on my own life, uh, there were times when I was taken by not tragic but serious thoughts. Well, of course, I'm serious, but at the same time, uh, being exposed to various forms of comedy did help me cope with uh, life's problems. And yeah, it, you know, being exposed to comedy is a great coping mechanism. I think, and I, I, I think many people would agree with that. But uh, I think. There's something that goes beyond it. And, uh, comedy is a manifestation of great intellect, and uh, comedy is where you have all the world's problems brought together into one crucible uh, from which you can probably uh, give birth to new ways to think about the world and so on. So I regard comedy as one of the most creative forms ever made by humans and you must also remember the fact that you know of all the human animal species arguably uh, the human being is the only species that would engage in comic actions uh, you know of course uh, there are some reports that rats laugh make laughter laughing sounds um, uh, this was studied by Panksep and there is report of very high frequency uh, mirth sound made by rats and these would correspond to uh, laughter but uh, at the same time from a theological point of view these would risk correspond to kind of horsing around type activities you know um, <coughs> rough uh, tumble and uh, you know just fooling around type uh, behavior that could be seen observed in human uh, children as well. And these are very important and etymologically um, pro if, and from evolution point of view, laughter would have come from these acts of very basic animal behavior. And that is still existent in human behavior too. But uh, at the same time, we can engage ourselves in cognitive comedy too. Very sophisticated ways to deal with things that are scientifically, philosophically, and politically important. And, you know, I, I think when you can do that, you are a better person. And I find comedy very interesting. For example, uh, I was born in 1962, and, you know, that was, that was the year when the Cuban Missile Crisis happened. And one year after that, uh, Stanley Kubrick was, came up with this really genius film, which was Dr. Stranger Up, while I stopped how I stopped worrying and learned to love the poem. This was released, I think, in 1963, or maybe 1963. But anyway, it was one year after the Cuban Missile Crisis, in which uh, the world came to the brink of extinction uh, because of this uh, confrontation between uh, the US and USSR on nuclear missiles and you know it was a really narrow escape so you could of course uh, take a uh, 
strategic approach and say serious things about uh, the nuclear age and the original thing of human intellect and so on. But instead of that, uh, you know, Stanley Kubrick came up with this really uh, comic uh, film starring uh, Peter Sellers. I think Peter Sellers played four roles. And this is brilliant. I mean, even today, uh, when we look back on all the things that would have been said about the nuclear missile crisis, I, I think uh, Stanley Kubrick's uh, Dr. Strange Love stands out as probably the most profound and original um, take at the issue. So I think that's the merit of uh, the comic approach to really serious matters because that's the only way probably you can deal with uh, issues such as you know, nuclear missiles uh, as you know uh, in a serious and robust way. <coughs> So the same goes also for uh, theological questions. Uh, Nietzsche famously said that God is dead. And you can make a really serious attempt at um, you know, explaining the existence of God or arguing against it. And you can really make a serious effort at negating some you know, claims by various religious uh, organizations uh, in the way uh, that was done by uh, Richard Dawkins, uh, The God of Delusion. Of course, this was a um, really wonderful book and I enjoyed it. But at the same time, you would feel that, you know, this, although since this was a comic, this is a sorry, serious attempt at, you know, um, this, this throning uh, God. Uh, people who believed in God might have been offended, and uh, I'm sure uh, you know there were people who were put off by what Richard Dawkins said in that book. Although I do believe that it's a valuable book and it's a wonderful book, um, there could be there could have been alternative um, approaches to the question of God, employing uh, comic relief, if you like, and, you know, um, for me, uh, the Hikai, Hitchhiker's Galaxy to, by uh, Douglas Adams was a uh, comic answer to the theological questions. Uh, you know, I really love this um, novel. Uh, of course, uh, people love it, and, you know, it's probably the Bible of, the new Bible of the 20th century. Um, you know, the way uh, Douglas Adams came up uh, with ideas uh, about the ultimate questions is so original and so balanced and so pro life and you know this famous answer to the ultimate question about the universe life and everything uh, which uh, the supercomputer needed uh, several million years to compute and you know the answer by the way was the famous 42 well, infamous 42, I should say. It's so wonderfully ridiculous. I mean, what is the ultimate... Uh, what is the answer to the ultimate question about existence, universe, and life, and everything? 42, well, how wonderful. I mean, and <coughs> this, of course, has a lot to do with how we frame our questions in the first place and what we regard as answers to a question, um, all these things. And, you know, it's all there, uh, encapsulated in this short treatment of the question, uh, answering 42. Uh, this is something really brilliant, I think, and, you know, and I, I like the way Douglas Adams uh, followed that, that up with this idea that the Earth was actually a supercomputer and, you know, because, you know, the humans waited for several million years and uh, the, then the computer said that the answer to the ultimate question about the universe, life and everything was 42. And then, uh, of course, the humans complained and uh, then uh, the supercomputer said that, well, it was the fault of the humans and probably they should have asked instead what was the ultimate question 
about uh, the universal life and everything else. And you know, so then uh, it took another several million, uh, several million years to compute that question. So the people were patiently waiting for the question to be computed. And that question, the compu- supercomputer that was calculating the ultimate question happened to be the Earth. And the Earth was demolished to make way for, um, you know, high, new highway in the galaxy. Uh, just, you know, a short time before the computation uh, for the ultimate question was over. So if, uh, you know, we waited for a few more hours or a few more days, I forgot um, the exact setting, uh, then we would have known the ultimate question uh, to life, universe, and everything. So it's so brilliant. I mean, you know, the absurdity of it. Uh, you know, uh, the, the idea that we would need a certain amount of computation to calculate uh, the ultimate question and ultimate answer is brilliant. And the way that uh, it was assumed that the Earth was the supercomputer that was calculating the question, ultimate question was brilliant. And also the way it was demolished, the Earth was demolished, just to make a way, make way for a new uh, highway in the galaxy. But it's so brilliant, I mean, because the universe doesn't wait for uh, the significance of our life to pray, be prayed out. It's an absurd place and, you know, things go that way. So uh, it would appear that uh, the more serious the question is, the comic uh, your approach could be. Uh, I'm not saying that uh, we couldn't take a serious approach to serious problems. We can't do that. We are always doing that. Uh, having said that, uh, you know, Maybe when we are in a stagnant position about uh, any serious problems, whether it is scientific or uh, political or ethical or cultural, maybe uh, when you know, the serious approaches do not go well, we might try alternative uh, comic approaches. And um, you know, in order to do that, we probably need to study how uh, we could, you know, go about um, in the cognition of uh, comedy structure. Uh, For example, as I said, uh, the Douglas Adams um, masterpiece, um, Hitler's Guide to Galaxy, uh, shows us how we can probably go around asking really serious questions about existence and so on because you know um, any answer probably wouldn't be enough um, you know, because as long as it is expressed by some uh, natural or mathematical languages it's just a statement and the question is whether answers to any serious question serious enough question could be contained in that uh, you know when you ask what is good for lunch uh, maybe you can have a very simple or simplistic answer to that and say, hey, you should have uh, sushi or you should have curry or you, know, you should have this ramen noodle because this is so great and so on. But even in that case, uh, the answer might actually depend on the person that you are answering to and on the you know, seasons and you know, <laughs> things that... Uh, can be related to only personally. So, you know, if when you really think about it, there is no single good answer to any single question. Um, so, you know, um, so this, this whole premise of uh, approaching a question as if there are some relevant answers might be wrong. And uh, Douglas Adams uh, Hitchcock's guide to the galaxy is proving, you know, is a kind of a, uh, you know, antidote to this toxic uh, attitude, if you like, of us uh, towards 
putting questions and as a new scientist in Japan, in this country, I'm always bombarded with the simplistic approach, attitude toward questioning and, you know, that's why I'm kind of uh, suspicious of this whole questions and answers idea. Uh, at the end of any public lecture, uh, there are always this custom of questions and answers sessions and I never felt that it went well. Um, there's something clumsy about it. You know, it is great for a speaker to make his or her case about an um, issue. And after that, maybe it'll be great to have some response from the audience. But probably it shouldn't be always questions and answers sessions because the assumption behind that kind of uh, session setting is probably wrong. I mean, you know, and I always, uh, you know, feel that no matter how you answer, there's this mismatch between the questions and answers. And if the answers could be provided straight in a straightforward manner, then maybe the questions have been rather simplistic and shallow. And if the questions are profound enough, uh, probably uh, there aren't any simplistic answers to that. So in any case, uh, the whole idea is uh, kaput. And so we should always uh, take a grain of salt when uh, you know, doing this, um, you know, when putting questions about uh, uh, these really serious issues like what is the ultimate purpose of life and what is the nature of our existence and, and what is consciousness and so on. By the way, um, I really love the way that TED Talks end with a comic uh, admiration of what has been said. Uh, you know, uh, it's ne probably never put on line, otherwise uh, unless for, uh, as a part of uh, the you know recording of a whole session, but it's you really get a kick out of you know the summing up by comedians because you know at the end of TED sessions uh, they always do that uh, you know uh, of course TED talks are a series of serious takes at uh, the world's pressing issues, but um, as I, I have been arguing. There's no single answer to any sufficiently interesting question. So uh, the, uh, the very premise of, you know, expecting a speaker to come up with a brilliant vision about anything is probably uh, not such a great idea. So it's always great to consume a serious take of any serious questions in a way that would involve the comic spirit. So the fact that the TED talk uh, curators, uh, Chris Anderson and other people, are putting the comedy session at the end of uh, the TED week, uh, nowadays held in Vancouver, I think it's, it tastes a really great taste. Uh, it, it shows a really great taste. Uh, probably we should probably uh, have a mandatory comic section after any serious uh, attempt at answering life's uh, questions. And that reminds me uh, that uh, in Japanese traditional play, uh, there are no plays and uh, kyogen plays, and no is a serious take uh, representing a dramatic uh, view of the how we have human live. Uh, sometimes involving tragic uh, themes and so no is uh, what the samurai warriors uh, who supported the artist art form uh, believed on the surface. I mean they were the formal um, viewpoints and you know not so directly connected to the ethics of samurai as in kabuki plays. Uh, it's a more abstract representation of what the 
Value systems, systems and built on showings of the samurai class was. And so, this is a really <coughs> serious part of Japanese traditional play. But at the same time, you have the Kyo Gen part, which is a comi- comic dissection of uh, the you know, assumptions about the values of the status quo of the society. So, that you know,、uh, the fact that No and Kyogen plays、uh, were always played together,、uh, you know, in a really a wonderful integrity.、Uh, I, I think that tells you a lot about the maturity of the spirit of the samurai、uh, in these days, and I found it always fascinating to think about it. Anyway,、um, the same can be said probably about Greek comedy and tragedy, and of course.、Uh, The great Magnus Opus by、uh, Dante.、Uh, you know, Dante's comedy, or Divine Comedy, is a really great work. And, you know, the word comedy should be interpreted with care here because appear, apparently comedy in the sense of Dante doesn't necessarily mean comedy in the present day sense.、Uh, you know,、uh, because Uh, comedy would be something that you make, would typically make you laugh、uh, sheer, out of sheerness and out of you know, misunderstandings and、uh, out of criticisms and so on. Uh, but uh, Dante's comedy or divine comedy is something more than that.、Uh, it supposedly encompasses all human existence and all that is to be found. On this earth and beyond, and, and, and the Divine Comedy by Dante、uh, is supposed to make you make the reader and make Dante happy at the end、uh, because of his、uh, reunion with Beatrice in the heaven. So that is ultimately a happy ending. But in the process, we are exposed to all these absurd. Uh, stupidity of the humankind. So that is、uh, actually something really interesting uh, about uh, Dante's Divine Comedy.、Um, I am now in front of the <coughs> palace of the Crown Prince, <coughs> Akshinomiya. And、uh, I'm walking towards Aoyama Ichome crossing. And there are a bunch of people here. Presumably, the officer was, is now over. So they are going home, walking probably to Aoyama Ichome. And、uh, I'm going along with the crowd.、Uh, it is so strange that,、uh, you know, my life. I have chosen a style where I don't align with the typical office worker. I mean, my life, life is so haphazard, my schedules are so you know, weird.、Uh, I don't go to a particular place regularly. So, you know, Japanese people are not like that typically. So, I'm always asked, I was asked yesterday even how I was spending my days. and. That is a question I find it so hard to answer. I'm not offended or anything, but、um, you know, they're curious. I mean, the Japanese people are curious in general. So it's in their nature to ask how I was spending my days. But、uh, it's really hard to tell because my life is full of non typical things. Like、uh, speaking to my iPhone like this is a really interesting activity for me. But you really need to you know, think hard and long before you can answer what the purpose of this I mean, <laughs> I don't know. I mean,、uh, why am I doing this? I'm just walking from the Tokyo FM radio station to TV Asahi, TV Asahi、uh, television studio. Um, if I'm speaking into my iPhone like this, but、uh, what is the significance of this? I don't know. Probably I would like to capture 
the truth of the universe and through my comic spirit and uh, anyway so yeah I was talking about Dante's divine comedy so you know many people have voted Dante's divine comedy as the greatest literary work to have come from the western civilization ever so they have put comedy at the top of you know uh, everything else and it's kind of interesting um, you know uh, the hell part is um, the most comic part of all uh, where in which Dante probably is taking revenge on people who have been torturing him in his life those uh, you know Hippocratic uh, self-centered uh, selfish uh, you know uh, people who go about their lives uh, with the sole purpose of doing something good for them themselves while not necessarily making other people happy on the way uh, we see a bunch of people here on this earth in this life uh, who are like that or like youtubers I mean do you like youtubers I'm a youtuber uh, but I'm talking about really successful youtubers who are advocating uh, efficient uh, charity or I quote the exact word uh, you know those, this idea that by putting programs on YouTube uh, which advocate uh, charity or, or altruism yeah I, I, I remember the name uh, was now uh, effective altruism uh, you know this is comic I mean you know the way these people like Mr. Beast is making billions of dollars and how they make a empire out of these videos by you know pretending to be altruistic and uh, with hidden well not so hidden obvious self-serving interests so we are living in this era and uh, you know everybody is a hypocrite and you know the decent way to deal with such phenomena might be actually to write a divine comedy 2023 um, in which you take revenge on these you know people uh, people who uh, advocate cryptocurrencies uh, blockchains <laughs> nfts that make a lot of money and they go away all these people uh, probably there's a hell designed specifically for these people probably uh, there's a hell specifically designed for me um, you know and it'll be interesting to think of the ways you suffer in those imaginary hells uh, you know I doubt even in Dante's days uh, people genuinely literally believed in the depiction of hells in Dante's writings I don't believe it I, I doubt it uh, these would have been uh, imaginary uh, envisions of you know some counterbalancing uh, what you find uh, really uh, bad about this particular life and uh, what you find bad about a certain group of people and um, so that's why these depictions of hell rings true even today because you feel that Dante is making a case for a sense of balance restored after uh, observing too much of these uh, you know, capricious manifestations of human existence so you can find um, you know present versions of these uh, questionable behaviors like billionaires who fly on private jets to uh, gather at an economic forum to discuss global warming well many people criticize that but it, it'll be much interesting to 
you know, think about how we can treat these people effectively in the modern day version of Divine Comedy. It'll be a great entertainment, I, I'm sure. Anyway, uh, so <laughs> that, that was a com- really comic part. I mean, so the first uh, part of the Divine Comedy, the uh, hell part, is the most very comic of all. And, uh, you know, you know that, I, I think comedy uh, has, was born out of this sense of life. I mean, you know, even in difficult uh, situations. I think the more difficult the situation becomes, the comic you can be. And that is so life. I mean, you feel that you are more energized to live rather than complaining about life. I mean, uh, in any person's life, there are things that would trouble you, that would make you really sad, that would make you angry, that would make you really upset. But when you complain about these things in a straightforward way, when you uh, cry with these things head on, then it's not really great about uh, uh, great for your life. But if you apply a sense of comedy and you know make a caricature of the things that you encounter, then you can you know create life energy if you like without hurting yourself or without uh, putting these people who are criticized in a unnecessary bad state of affairs. I mean, when you're criticized in a comic manner, uh, then you are all right. I mean, you might get offended to some degree, but you are not hurt beyond a measure. And that is actually what's happening in roast, roast, comic roast I mean, of US presence, uh, you know, when there's a correspondence dinner in, in the White House. And for example, Mr. when Mr. Uh, President like Barack Obama is roast, um, you know, he gets a kick out of it. I mean, uh, if you are good natured and you are supposed to take the whole thing good naturedly, that's what uh, Barack Obama did. That's what Mr. Trump did, couldn't do. That's why he canceled the whole thing. But, uh, you know, I think it is a sign of the healthiness of uh, human mind or indeed uh, human society that people can take roast, comic roast in a good natured manner. And that is how you can make uh, Nagomi out of uh, criticizing people and, uh, you know, accepting it. You know, it's a really great invention, if you like. I mean, in many political systems, politicians cannot take uh, criticisms and they try to suppress people's criticisms. But in a mature society, politicians should take criticisms in good-natured ways. Not always, but in some specified window of uh, you know, events, like in the White House Correspondence Dinner. And if you can take uh, healthy criticism as a comic roast and uh, in a good, good-natured way, then it's a great testimony of the fact that you can, you know, uh, deal with complex situations and you can make appropriate decisions. I think there is a genuine correlation co- co- uh, uh, correlation between the, your ability to make uh, appropriate decisions and the ability to take comedy out of difficult questions. Uh, I don't know if what you think of President Donald Trump, but uh, no, uh, sorry, not Trump, uh, Ronald Reagan. Uh, I, I, I know that, uh, there are many, many people who are not so fond of uh, his policies, but uh, I, I think he can be President uh, Reagan can be at least credited for his uh, humor when he was shot uh, after just you know, months after his inauguration. And, you know, he was carried to the hospital. And when he saw his wife, uh, Nancy Reagan, 
uh, you know, he reportedly said to Nancy, darling, I, I forgot to duck. And, you know, that was a great show of comedy. <clears throat> and when he was going to be operated, I hear that uh, President Reagan's blood pressure was so low. It was considered dangerous at one time. <clears throat> and, you know, just before the operation, um, President Reagan uh, took off his oxygen mask and asked the doctors in the operation room, are you Republicans? And, you know, the doctors answered, no, President, we are Democrats. But for this day alone, we'll be Republicans. And that was a great show of comedy, comic spirit from the president and from the doctors around. And I, I think, you know, well, I, I think that could be a sign that President Reagan was able to make appropriate decisions. Because, you know, comedy is actually associated with metacognition. Uh, the ability to see yourself from the outside. And <clears throat> when you are equipped with the ability to see yourself from the outside, it is a great sign. And uh, dictators cannot take jokes. And dictators cannot make great decisions precisely because they do not have metacognition. That's my assessment of uh, many dictators. And so uh, I, I, I think President Zelensky is making a really great wartime present, not only because of his personal trait, but also uh, in, because of his career as a comedian. Actually, a comedian would make the great, make a great uh, wartime present. And that is, I, I think, proved, being proved by President Zelensky of Ukraine. I don't know where that war is going, but probably uh, Mr. Zelensky is making a better present than Mr. Putin. Uh, that's my own personal opinion, of course. Uh, but uh, something that probably would ring through for many people in today's world. So I really need to come back to the question of consciousness. <clears throat> um, at present, it is it's really difficult to see how you can apply comedy toward uh, consciousness studies. But in a way, when Albert Einstein came up with theory of relativity, the way he asked uh, himself, what happened, what would happen if you, you know, pass through a uh, light with the speed of light? I think that's a good, that was a great question. A question that people wouldn't typically ask, but a question which essentially led to the birth of the theory of relativity. And uh, probably uh, same, the same kind of questions can be asked about uh, consciousness studies. For probably uh, we are too serious about consciousness studies. I mean, we ask the same questions over and over again. For example, how would neural activities give rise to consciousness? And how, what is the neural coverage of consciousness? But these are legitimate questions. And these questions can be asked tens of thousands of times. But at the same time, you would feel that these questions are probably too serious. I mean, there could be some more absurd questions. Like uh, the question of Einstein asked, what happens when you <laughs> pursue uh, light with the speed of light? Uh, that is a really absurd question. But by asking absurd questions, maybe you can go beyond the convention of asking serious questions, only serious questions. So, you know, what is the most absurd question about consciousness? You should really ask that. And when you, you know, can define the question, and when you tackle the question, maybe we can solve the problem of consciousness seriously and comically. Um, you know, statistics. Um, of course, people are fond of statistics, and I'm always complaining about the statistics. Not as a means of analyzing neural activities. Well, that is something you can obviously do, and that is something you can 
always work out, I mean, in conventional way. So I have no problem with statistics per se, but, but I do have problem with uh, its application to consciousness. And I think people are too straightforward and serious about applying, applying statistics to consciousness. Now I'm in front of the Roppongi Mittam. Uh, in the sense, this whole episode of uh, Ken Mogi's Story to Brain Radio is comic. I mean, I'm walking through Tokyo. Uh, yeah, really serious people here, uh, hurrying back to their homes. Or the, or since this is Friday, maybe they would be hurrying off to their bars and restaurants for a date. And here I am talking nonsense into my iPhone. Uh, <laughs> this is really strange, unscripted. All I'm saying doesn't come from large language models. That's the issue that we discussed in my previous episode of Ken Mogi's Street Brain Radio. Uh, street, sorry, Street Brain Radio. I didn't say straight brain radio. It doesn't really matter for me if your brain is straight or gay. It doesn't really make any difference. Uh, it's your choice. Uh, uh, anyway, um, yes. So I was, as I was saying, uh, maybe we can ask, we, may, we should ask comical questions. Only then probably we'll be able to answer uh, the questions about consciousness. Uh, we should, probably we should put comic questions to about the question of God or, you know, about the question of free will. Uh, only then probably we could, uh, you know, approach the answer, if there is one. Uh, you know, when it comes to these questions like consciousness and God and free will, uh, people tend to be really serious and for good reasons. I mean, you, of course you can be serious about these things. But um, at the same time, that would probably limit your thinking to within the box. And if you want to think outside the box, then uh, you really need to put yourself in a comic box and be a comedian and think in absurd terms. I mean, I, I, I think comedy is ultimately not about producing laughter. Of course, you can do that. Uh, but, you know, I, I think a real comedy is absurd. I mean, in questioning the very foundations of significance, meaning, um, existence. And I think Monty Python Frank Circus often succeeded in producing laughter in a very absurd way. I think absurd comedy is probably as intelligent as you can get. And... Uh, I think Monty Python's Frank Circus was a great uh, attempt at that. And we should always relieve the Monty Python moment. And, uh, you know, uh, of course we have serious problems. For example, we have the mutually assured destruction nonsense in nuclear deterrent. And uh, Dr. Strange Lab was a great uh, comic answer to that. But, you know, people consume Dr. Strange Love in that particular context. I mean, they consume it as a comic depiction of the nuclear age. And they do not go further than that. I mean, they do not think that you can actually get sensible answers from that kind of approach. However, if you really think that... Uh, think hard and long about the foundations of nuclear deterrent assured by mutually assured destruction uh, combined with the speed of uh, Dr. Sunja then maybe just maybe you can probably arrive at a realization of some really valuable truth about the life uh, about the human being and about uh, cognitive processes in general. Now I'm, I'm at Roppongi Crossing. 
uh, I can see the amount of Roppongi cafe. Uh, I've never been in that cafe. It's too famous. I mean, it's pinky, and I know it's a popular place, but I never, I've never been there. There's something about that iconic cafe that is not really consistent with my mundane existence. So I'm surrounded by a bunch of tourists and people from abroad, and you know, this district is famous for such kinds of people. That I'm, I'm great because uh, I'm feeling great because、uh, I'm in a comic spirit. <laughs>、um, yeah. So, where would that comic take be in questions concerning consciousness? Maybe we should write、uh, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Comic version concerning consciousness, life, existence, and then we'll be probably able to do something about this enigma.、Um, you know, I,、um, I used to be really serious when I was a kid, and when I used to be really serious when I was a teenager. But as I grew older, As I matured, hopefully, I find myself more sympathetic with、uh, comedy, especially absurd forms of comedy. So, first, I remain really serious in my pursuit, in my pursuit of the holy grail of consciousness,、uh, qualia, free will. But、um, at the same time, I feel that.、Uh, There should be a comic version of、uh, Parushpal, for example.、Uh, you know, <laughs> Wagner's Parushpal is a really serious take out、um, these things, redemption. But、uh, there could be a comic version of it without, of course, eroding the seriousness of the spirit. I, I think Douglas Adams was probably a really serious man in writing Hitchhiker's Guide to. Thank you, Alexi. I think only a, serious, only a very serious man can write work like that. And <coughs> so there's something to be said about、uh, the application of comic script to a real serious era,、uh, serious subject. And that is probably where the most significant lines of works could to be found.、Uh, In a sense, Dante's Divine Comedy was a work in that genre. And probably that's a genre which attracts me the most of all human activities. This marriage of serious intentions with comic,、um, spontaneous creations.、Uh, I'm actually approaching. Roppong Hills now, so、uh, I might actually stop recording for a moment because I'm approaching an area where there are many, too many people. And if they listen to my crazy talk into the iPhone, probably they might、uh, think I am you know, strange,、uh, which I am, but I don't want to make it too obvious. So I'm in Roppong Hills now and I'm coming very close to Telebi Asahi, so I should be stopping my recording、uh, very soon. But、uh, throughout this Moro solo key,、uh, I think I've realized again that、uh, the more serious your question is, the more comic your approach should be. And I think this is a really wonderful approach. And you know, when you think about comedy, you tend to think about social issues. And they, these are great.、Uh, you know, we should fight discrimination, prejudice, and so on with the help, with a little help from the spirit of comedy. And that's what the comedians are doing. But at the same time, we probably should aim at even greater things.、Um, ultimate questions about、uh, existence and consciousness and freedom and 
natural roads and time and so yeah time yeah time we should time is a really serious uh, issue so I think we should probably take a comic approach to time and then probably we would be better off uh, in deciphering the enigma that is existence so I'm very close to uh, KB Asahi now and I can see the Tokyo Tower it's a beautiful uh, ornament of the Tokyo sky Tokyo Tower and I'm going down the steps that lead to a pond next to KB Asahi I always you know love to walk along this dark corridor uh, pathway before I go into the brilliant lights of the TV station. Uh, so I think it's time for me to sum up. Um, when we live, uh, there was somebody passing by, so I was... <laughs> so when we live, uh, we are faced with many difficult questions, some of them serious and others very serious. When we are trying to deal with these uh, questions, uh, both emotionally and intellectually, uh, we really need to take a comic stance. The more serious a problem is, the more comic our approach should be. That's the only way we can match the crest, we can answer to the challenge in a way that would give the ultimate balance and dynamics to the life that we are living on this really, really strange arena that is this universe. So that has been my uh, Street Brain Radio this time. And thank you for listening. <laughs>